mounting pressure on the government to come clean on the Nissan deal. As Labour criticised secret deals behind closed doors and other manufacturers say they want as good a post-Brexit deal as Nissan, the chair of the Commons Business Committee says he has tough questions for ministers. Well, what are the criteria in which companies are to be selected? Is it going to be just specific companies? Well, how is that going to work? Is it just those that shout the loudest? Also this lunchtime, the drug test shambles at Rio. Many athletes missed giving samples. Lots simply couldn't be found. Birmingham police launch a criminal investigation as two children die in a house fire. And turning his son's doodles into art, a dad's commitment to his little boy's passion. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Alistair Stewart. Good afternoon, killjoys or custodians of the taxpayers' interests. More and more voices are being raised over the deal that persuaded Nissan to continue investing in a post-Brexit Britain. Labour says it's secret deals behind closed doors. And the chair of the powerful Commons Business Committee says he wants to grill the man who did the deal, Secretary of State Greg Clark, in the interests of transparency. It's taxpayers' money, he says. Is it just going to be those who shout the loudest? That, as other manufacturers say, they want whatever Nissan got, whatever it was. Our political correspondent Paul Brand reports. The benefits of securing this plant may be clear. 7,000 British jobs, 600,000 cars to sell around the world. But just what it'll cost us is still the big unknown. With growing calls for the government to reveal exactly what they offered Nissan in return for its investment. Has cash, either directly or indirectly, been given to Nissan? But I also think there's a wider point about, well, what are the criteria in which companies are to be selected? Is it going to be just specific companies? Well, how's that going to work? Is it just those that shout the loudest? Here's what we do know already. Nissan made its position clear before the referendum, stating in February that remaining in the EU made the most sense. After the vote to leave, its chief executive Carlos Goen met Theresa May in Downing Street to discuss concerns about trade tariffs. Five days later, the business secretary, Greg Clark, flew to Japan to meet with Nissan's board. Then came the news yesterday that Nissan wouldn't just keep its plant going, but expand it further, building two new car models here. The government denies it offered compensation if costs rise due to Brexit, and so far this is the best explanation we've been given. When it comes to the automotive sector, there's so much trade from the continent of Europe to Britain and vice versa that actually there is strong mutual interest in having a, a, a practical and strong deal there. And we were able to, uh, I think, to demonstrate our seriousness of intention there. Nissan is a vital employer. One percent of Britain's exports are made at this plant alone. The problem for the government now is the other 99 percent. Business is a competitive game and everyone else will want whatever Nissan's got. Well, Downing Street is still insisting this lunchtime there was no sweetheart deal for Nissan, no special compensation package, no special deal on tariffs, but it must have been something pretty major in order for the government to grab hold of Nissan's steering wheel and get to do a complete U-turn here, from saying it was considering reducing investment in the UK to then increasing investment significantly in its Sunderland plant. Now, there is no doubt that the Nissan is a hugely symbolic employer. It was a huge part of the referendum debate, particularly in the North East. The government's got pretty excited, I think, about that symbolism. The problem now is the practicality and perhaps the price of forging a similar deal with everybody else. Paul, thank you. Syrian rebels have launched a big push to break the Aleppo siege. Government-held areas of the city have come under heavy shelling and at least a dozen civilians are reported to have been killed. 275,000 people have besieged in the city by President Assad's forces, backed by the Russians for several months. Central Korea has the latest. The big push to break the Aleppo siege began this morning by Syrian rebels. Unverified footage showed a car bomb hitting a checkpoint in government-controlled targets in the west of the city. As further unconfirmed video appeared to show rebels firing hundreds of missiles. 
A UK-based monitoring group saying at least 15 civilians have been killed. So far, these attacks are said to be coming from outside the city, but it's understood rebels inside will also join the offensive. Aleppo was once Syria's second city. Now much of it lies in ruins. It's been subjected to a relentless aerial bombing campaign by the Assad regime and its Russian allies, who've encircled the eastern half of the city, trapping a quarter of a million people and pounding the territory with daily airstrikes. At least 500 people have been killed in the last month alone. But liberating Aleppo won't be easy. They're fighting against a Syrian army supported by the Lebanese, Iranian, as well as other militia, and bolstered by Russian firepower. And with the rebels entangled with extremist groups, from the Western perspective at least, they're on their own. Sejal Karia, ITV News. Serious failings have been uncovered in the anti-doping operation at this year's Rio Olympic Games. In a 55-page report, the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, revealed that during the games of the 11,500 athletes competing, there were no records of any drug testing for more than 4,000 of them this year. And on some days, up to half of the planned tests in the athletes' village were abandoned because the athletes couldn't be found. Well, joining me live in the studio is our sports correspondent, uh, Ian Payne. Um, after all of the scandal that, that you and Steve have reported on that was going on in Russia and what have you, this had to be watertight and it's leaking like a sieve. Yeah, it seems to be, Alistair, particularly when you look at what, what WADA have done. So let me try and explain the background to this. Anti-doping and drug testing during the Olympics is looked after by the International Olympic Committee. That's the organising people who look after the, uh, the Olympics. So they're looking after that. WADA were just there as observers and they basically didn't like what they found. So let's have a look at some of the things that they said. They said there wasn't enough money spent on anti-doping. That was one of the big problems. There wasn't enough training. So the chaperones, these are the people who are with the athletes, so when they need to be tested, say, well, they're in the dining hall or they're in their room or whatever, didn't know where they were. Uh, they didn't have enough training. They didn't speak English. The computers didn't work. Some of the computers didn't have printers. And also, when you look at the statistics, 50%, as you said before, of tests on some days weren't carried out because they couldn't find the athletes. Uh, let's have a look at football. There was no out-of-competition testing, i.e. when they were resting between sure. games during the Olympics at all, and hardly any blood tests on some of the more visible sports, like weightlifting, at all during the Olympics. So it's pretty damning statistics. The, the, the one piece of good news for the Olympics in, in Rio was the fact that the WADA said, yes, the testing laboratory was very good, you just didn't do enough tests. <laughs> it just wasn't very busy. Yeah. Was there no preliminary check on it? Did nobody go and have a look to make sure it was up well, to standard? Well, that's interesting because UK anti-doping was actually part of a sort of task force that went over there after the Russian scandal to make sure that everything would work. Now, I haven't seen their report, but obviously they thought things would be better than they actually were. But when you look at how many people missed tests, how many people haven't been tested at all in 2016, how little money was spent on it. And then the IOC come out and talk to their expert, who's a doctor, and says, we think it was a great success anti-doping-wise. So there's a huge margin between the two. Final point, and you and I were looking at this report together yeah. earlier this morning. So Craig Reedy, president of WADA, says, but overall, it's fine. Yeah. Is he having his cake and eating it? I'm not sure whether he, he says overall... He feels overall it's fine. I think overall he feels that, you know, they are doing their bit to ensure that enough testing gets done throughout the year and during major championships. But they are very stringent in their observations and basically they came up very short this time. Fascinating. Ian, thank you very much. Now, the NHS in England is failing hundreds of millions of pounds... is falling, I do beg your pardon, hundreds of millions of pounds short in efforts to claw money back from so-called health tourists, according to a report from the National Audit Office. Government aims to recover £500 million by 2018, but it's estimated that just over half is likely to be paid back by overseas patients who are not entitled to free treatment. The Department of Health says that the amount it gets back from overseas payments has more than trebled in the last three years. And South Yorkshire police are investigating after the body of a 13-year-old boy was found in a burnt-out shed near Doncaster. Emergency services were called to a house in Campsall, South Yorkshire, last night after reports of a fire. The teenager's body was found at the scene after the fire was extinguished. 
Police have launched a criminal investigation after the death of two children at a house in Birmingham. Emergency services were called to a house fire in Hampstead in the early hours of this morning. A boy and girl were found in the house and died later in hospital. Well, Ben Chapman joins us live from the scene now. Um, ben, what have you been able to find out on location? Well, what we've been told is that neighbours last night carried these two children out of the house and performed CPR while they waited for paramedics to arrive. But when they did, this boy and a girl, who neighbours say are aged between about six and eight, were already in cardiac arrest. They were rushed to hospital and they were pronounced dead when they arrived. A woman thought to be the, the children's mother was also seen by paramedics here, but she was unharmed. Now, we know that firefighters were called at about half past three, 20 to four, uh, this morning, uh, they extinguished a fire in the hallway of the house. That fire they are describing and treating as suspicious and police have launched a criminal investigation. They say that as yet the cause of death of these two children is not known and the events of this morning remain unclear and they say they're still trying to piece together what happened. Now neighbours in this street uh, have described the children who used to play out here as cheerful. They say they're devastated they won't hear their voices anymore. Police are expected to update us uh, on what happened to them very shortly. Ben, thank you. Still to come this lunchtime, scientists hail a major breakthrough on a new contraceptive for men. And from paper to reality, the dad turning his son's doodles into art. But first, in the next hour, Uber drivers will find out if they're eligible for holiday pay, guaranteed minimum wage and sick pay when an employment tribunal delivers its judgment in a test case bought by the drivers. They're questioning their status as self-employed. Company matches people looking for a cab with drivers nearby. Well, our consumer editor, Chris Choi, is here. Um, it's a pretty simple argument with great significance. Take us through the argument first. What a row it is. Yeah. On the one side, as you say, we have these drivers, just one group of the Uber drivers, not all of them, who say that they should get basic workers' rights. Uber saying nothing of the sort because these drivers can pick and choose work when and how they like. Let me talk you through the basics of this tribunal that's happening very, very shortly. Um, Uber has around, I was surprised at the figure, 42,000 drivers in the UK. The company calls them partners, regarding them as self-employed. Today's test case in the tribunal involves 19 drivers claiming workers' rights, things like minimum wage, paid leave and regular breaks. Now, earlier we spoke to one of the Uber drivers, Robert Dawson. We said to him, look, the, this is a, a very popular app. He says that the fares can look attractive because very often it's the drivers bearing the brunt. The driver is giving the passenger the reduction in, in fare, not the operator. It's coming out of my pocket. I don't want to work 15 hours a day if I can earn the same money and earn it in eight hours. An office worker doesn't work 15 hours a day, I'm sure. Well, that's an Uber driver and the Uber arguments, but does this form of employment extend more widely? Is there greater significance? Absolutely. There, there are big ramifications on what is becoming known as the gig economy. This is growing all the time. It's people regarded as self-employed who work often for app firms like Uber, often people like drivers, couriers, working for companies like Uber, Deliveroo, Hermes. A lot of those think that they should be getting rights, and it's not just the courts that are grappling with this, also the tax authorities and unions trying to get a much clearer differentiation. Chris, thank you. We'll have the result later. Thank you very much. Now, as winter approaches, homeowners and businesses at risk of flooding are being given advice on how to protect from, prepare for and recover after storms and floods. The Independent Property Flood Resilience action plan highlights the importance of taking precautionary measures and how insurers can better help home and business owners. Warren Nettleford has more. From Yorkshire to Cumbria to Lancashire, it's less than a year since record-breaking rainfall transformed towns and villages into rushing torrents. The sheer scale of the damage meant what was lost in minutes has taken many months to rebuild but now advice is being offered on better protection from future floods. Well, the thing I don't think you'll be able to avoid is flooding. 
the fact is the weather has been changing and people are exposed to flood risk. What this will do is it will help protect their homes from, or buildings from water ingress, but most importantly, if they're flooded, it will help them get back to living or operating their businesses much, much more quickly and it will take away lots of misery that people have experienced. Mike Corker is pointing to where the water level reached last December. The newly varnished floors and decor tell more of his story. 11 months on, his family still aren't back inside their home. Um, it, was, it was bizarre, it was unreal, it was something that I didn't know so how to react to because I hadn't prepared for it and uh, I don't think there's any way you can prepare for that because you don't know how you're going to react to it. Take a look and you'll see the power sockets are a bit higher than in normal homes. Small changes to building regulations like this are recommended in the report. But our weather and our seasons remain unpredictable. The government can only hope that suggestions like these can offer some protection and reassurance. Warren Nettleford, ITV News. Now, scientists believe that they have made a major breakthrough on a new contraceptive for men. The hormone injection suppresses the production of sperm. In a trial, it was tested on 350 men around the world. They were given two injections, one every eight weeks, which lowered their sperm count. And it was found to be 96% effective in preventing pregnancy. During the trial, however, 20 of the men dropped out because of side effects, including mood changes and depression. Well, joining me now in the studio is Dr Diana Mansour from the Faculty for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Nikki Hodgson, an author on sexual health and gender politics. Diana, let me come to you first. We know from those numbers, and it's been peer-reviewed, that, that it works as a contraceptive, but in your view, are there sexual health problems here? I think that we are really welcoming choice for contraception for both men and women. And up until very recently, for men, there's just been condoms or vasectomy. And to actually have a hormonal contraceptive that will actually provide effective contraception, the same as the combined pill, I think is a real breakthrough. We but, have had some work on No, this absolutely, but one of the key things about the condom methodology for men is that there is the additional protection about sexually transmitted disease. Absolutely, and that's where you don't get that, both for men and women using any hormonal method or vasectomy. Yeah. But for this particular method, it does seem to be effective. Um, I think that there's some of the things that you would see around the side effects um, may be more of an issue for men than women. Because we women <laughs> have to have a baby. And for you guys, well, sure. you know, well, it, maybe something... I crossed the line now, because when, when we were discussing... <laughs> yeah, OK. When we were discussing this upstairs, of course, the, this is a programme that's produced in the main by women. And, of course, they were saying, oh, mood swings and depression, <laughs> dear, oh, dear, and what have you. I mean, is this really at heart? As, as, in fact, Nikki says as well, this is about gender equality. Pull your weight. Yeah, I think it is. And it's really interesting because if you look historically at contraception, men did take responsibility because women weren't, aim and they weren't able themselves to go get contraception because there were so many um, issues around propriety in doing so. And then the pill came along and then the onus was put back on women, which was good and bad. Um, and now this is a chance to kind of even, even it up a little bit. And the thing I would say is it's interesting, if men have hated using condoms for so many years, well, they have this other option and it might make them look at condoms a little bit differently. Uh, the, the injection is in a sensitive area <laughs> that, that may bring tears to the eyes. Uh, we've had a few people on Facebook who've come in. Sylvia McElroy from Belfast says it's about time that there was an option for men to be as responsible as women for contraception. And Garrick uh, Damarell from Plymouth says it's good for men to have the same options as women. He thinks it can only be a good thing for everyone. Responsibility is a key thing there as well. Oh, yes, I've had the jab. I'm safe as houses. Well, of course, but then that works both ways. You know, men worry too if women are telling the truth about whether they've taken the pill. You know, that's, it's kind of a natural anxiety to have if you haven't seen your partner uh, be injected or, you know, take something. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's so much of an issue. And, and the other thing is that... Uh, the kind of the crux of the matter is that men never have the same anxiety yeah. um, because they can't physically get pregnant. Oh. And so uh, th I think that might worry a few sure. women. Final quick word from you. Uh, Leon Teal from Bradford disagrees. It's pointless and wouldn't trust it as it's only 96% effective. A perfectionist writes there. You're confident of this as a form of contraception? Well, many of the methods we use, like the pill, um, in typical use, the failure rate's about 4 or 5%. Mm. So this is just as effective. And, yes, I agree. I think there are many men who are very interested in a method. We need some more research in this area, but I think it's a very positive move. Fascinating conversation. Thank you both very much indeed for coming in. Thank you.
Well, it certainly sparked, as I said earlier on, debate on Facebook. Go to our page and uh, you can join into that debate now. Whether you trust the contraceptive injection for men, uh, just take part in the poll there as well. All of that debate, itv.com slash news. Finally, like most seven-year-olds, Dominic Curtis loves to draw. His favourite thing to sketch? Animals. His family can't always tell exactly what the animal is that he's trying to draw, so Dad decided to make his scribbles just a little bit more, shall we say, lifelike. Chris Cunningham explains. Right, so we're just going to have a look at the, um, the pigs. Uh... Life through the eyes of a child. A half-term visit to a petting zoo, the perfect opportunity to get out pen and pad. And like all parents, Dom's dad is proud of his son's creations. So much so, in fact, that he's decided to bring them to life. Two years ago, basically, he was just drew, drawing these brilliant pictures, and you can obviously decide to stick them on your fridge or put them in a frame or send them to your relatives, and I just thought, there's something more in this. What we need to do, right? Tom uses his skills on Photoshop to make Dom's simplistic drawings into strange and wonderful realistic pictures, a time-consuming process that's worth every second. And their work has also captured the public's imagination, as Dom now has over 61,000 followers on Instagram, all waiting to see what he will draw next. I like to draw an alien spaceship. In fact, I could do one now. <laughs> We've also got the idea of doing um, kind of quite fantastical stuff. He keeps on drawing really amazing monsters and spaceships, so that's kind of coming next. But then from that point onwards, I mean, we're getting loads of requests now from people all over the world saying, you know, can you do my kid's picture? And I think, you know, as I, uh, I kind of really believe that the, the eye in things I have drawn isn't just about Dominic, it's about, it's about kids everywhere. And, you know, all kids are amazing artists and uh, we can do really great stuff with it. Yes. Do I sign it? You're right, Dom? So, as Dom signs off on his latest masterpiece, you can rest assured it won't be long before it springs to life. Chris Cunningham, ITV News. Love it. That's it. Bye-bye. <laughs>